Well, good morning, everybody. In case we know, know each other, I'm Kenny. I'm a pastor at the Village Church of Lincolnshire in Lake Forest, Illinois. And I want to thank you for joining us for our daily office. Every weekday at 10, we just get together, read a little scripture, and pray. And today I want to read for you from 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. These uh, verses stuck out to me because uh, I've been thinking a lot about people pleasing lately, to just put it baldly. There, there's something in me, and I suspect there's something in most of us, that just longs to make other people happy. And when we can sense that we're not making them happy, uh, we feel uncomfortable. And we may be tempted to compromise in different ways, or we may be tempted to bite off more than we can choose, to, to uh, say yes to every request that comes our way, or to change our thinking based on whoever we happen to be talking to. But what I'm going to read today is just a short passage from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. It comes in the midst of these people who are, um, frankly, not very impressed by Paul. They, they have this worldly notion of what wisdom should look like. But Paul comes to them in foolishness, in weakness. He comes not this, as this grand, eloquent orator, but as this weak and lowly preacher of the gospel. He, you know, that's his whole shtick. He's, God has demonstrated his power through the, the weakness of the cross. And Paul has shaped his life in preaching around that. But in Corinthian, in Corinth, excuse me, they're, they're judging Paul because he's not a very wise guy. He's not a very eloquent guy. He's not the kind of guy that you would want to follow. He's not a celebrity preacher. But how does Paul respond to that? He says a lot of things, but here's, here's what struck me. And again, this is 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 5. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. So Paul's talking about judgment. He's basically saying, don't judge me. Don't judge my decisions. Don't judge my words. Don't judge the way I live my life. Why? Because I have nothing to be judged for. I, I am aware of no fault in myself. You may disagree. You may not like what I'm doing, but I am being a faithful steward of the gospel. But, you know, that could be a little prideful. <laughs> you know, that could be a little conceited. So he, he qualifies it by saying, but that's not what acquits me. The fact that I know nothing against myself, the fact that I am not aware of any sins in me or any uh, wrong roads I'm traveling down for which I deserve judgment, none of that is the reason I am acquitted. Because ultimately, it is the Lord who is my judge. That's what Paul is saying. So when people pronounce judgment against him, they're getting ahead of themselves. And they're usurping for themselves an authority that they don't have. Because there will come a time when the Lord will judge. And we know that's true because of the resurrection. That's how Paul argues in Acts 17, that God sent his son and God raised him from the dead as a sure sign that he would judge the living and the dead. So there's a future judgment, but there's also a past judgment that took place on the cross. And it's through that judgment that God bore upon Jesus that our sins are wiped clean. And the big theological word for this is we are justified. We receive Christ's righteousness only for our faith, not because of any works we've done, but because of the work he did for us in his life and death. So when Paul talks about judgment, he's saying, don't judge me because I have already been judged in Christ at the cross and I will be judged in the future and I will be found in Christ and I will be acquitted and I will be welcomed into God's home. I will be welcomed into eternal fellowship with him. So if you're in Christ, 
if I'm in Christ, there is no more condemnation for us. There is no more wrath for us. We have been judged with Christ, and we are in Christ, and we are being prepared and preserved until that day when the final judgment comes, and we will be found in Christ. So yes, we have a desire to please people. Yes, we want to make people happy. Yes, we want to say yes as much as we possibly can. Um, but let's not do that from a place of, from a lack of identity, from a lack of security. Pleasing people, having their favor, having their approval, having their delight, is not the thing that will ultimately make us feel happy and healthy and whole. We only get that from God's good pleasure. We only get that by looking in the face of our Father and hearing him say, you are a son, you are a daughter. In Christ, I am pleased with you. So I pray today that we would find our pleasure, that we would find our identity and our worth and our value in Christ alone. Not in ourselves, not in, our, not in other people and the things we do to make them happy, but in Christ. I'm going to pray for us now, and I would encourage you, as always, if you have a specific re uh, prayer request, just go ahead and share that in the comment stream. Okay, let's pray. Father, what a privilege it is to be your sons and daughters. What a privilege it is to count ourselves among those in whom you take great delight. We thank you, Lord, for this precious gift. We thank you, Lord, there, that there is nothing we could have done to merit your good pleasure. And there is nothing we can do or fail to do to lose it. Because in Christ you have made us your own. We thank you for that gift of immeasurable grace. You fit, we thank you for the, the Holy Spirit who comes to indwell us who comes to continually mold us into the image of Christ. And we trust that when he returns, we will be found in him. And that our acquittal before your great throne will not be based on anything we accomplished in this life or failed to accomplish, Lord, but it will be based upon what Jesus accomplished for us in his life and in his death. So, Lord, help us to run to him today. Lord, when we feel pressed upon by the demands of others, when we feel tempted to compromise, when we feel like rolling over when somebody presses us a little bit, when we feel like saying yes more often than we should, and all the other ways in which we... Um, allow our desire for others' approval to dictate our decisions and how we live our lives. We pray that by your grace, we would be fortified against those desires and against those temptations. Lord, that yes, we would seek peace with others and we would be as agreeable as we could be and that we would listen respectfully and patiently to others when they express perhaps contrary wishes than what we have. Uh, that we would look for ways to say yes to others' requests as much as possible. All that's good, Lord. But I pray that it would never come from a place of lack, that it would never come as a part of our pursuit to uh, justify ourselves in the eyes of others. We thank you that we are justified in your eyes by faith in Christ alone. Lord, today, as we think about the situation we're in, we just pray for your mercy. We pray that you would stop the spread of the disease. You, I, we pray for clarity and information that we would know if you hadn't, in, in fact, stopped the spread. We pray for all the logistics around testing and antibody testing and contact tracing and all those things, Lord, all those complicated things 
We pray that you would make it abundantly clear to us, to the experts, to the leaders who are in charge, when this thing is peeling back and when it's safe to start moving forward. I pray, Lord, we wouldn't be in a hurry. But at the same time, I pray for a sense of urgency as there are people who are hurting from the disease and there are people who are hurting from its cure as well. I pray for great compassion on our part as individuals, on our society as whole. I pray that people wouldn't value their rights in the abstract over the, the needs and the frailties of real people, concrete people. Lord, I pray for our churches during this time. Ours in particular, but churches across the nation and the world. Moving towards reopening is complicated. We have lots of questions to ask about how to protect people and how to be safe and how to be wise. I pray you'd give church leaders everywhere wisdom in these things. I pray that you'd give the people in the churches um, gracious hearts, that they would participate in the conversation, but that they wouldn't be taken to bitterness or to second guessing. I pray that we would all step up in the ways that we need to, that we would all be flexible in the ways we need to. And I pray, Lord, that this would be a beautiful moment for your church. That as we move past what we had taken for granted and what we had taken as normal, and we move into a sort of new normal, Lord, that you would open our eyes to see the things to which we may have been blind before. Pray you would go before us. Pray that you would meet us in whatever awkwardness or discomfort may be ahead of us. Pray you'd give us great clarity of vision to know how best to gather before that day when we can finally all gather together again. Lord, as I look at my friends here and what they're asking for, Stuart does well to remind us of all the struggling small business owners. Um, this is hard, Lord. And though we thank you for the aid that has come from the government, that can only do so much. And for a lot of these people, they have either already lost their livelihood or they will. They've seen their life's work dashed. They've watched dreams go up in smoke. They've had to let employees go. They've had to turn away customers. They've had to do a hundred other things they never thought they'd have to do when they went into business. Help us to remember that these are people, that they're not nameless, faceless uh, business owners but that they're real people with real responsibilities and real needs, people who want to serve their employees and their customers and their families and their communities. And I pray that you would bless them, and you would protect them, and that you would uphold them. I see that Anne has asked us to pray for our leaders. and Lord, we have been praying for them, but she's good to remind us that we cannot pray for them enough feels self-serving as I am one of them, but Lord, I, I thank you to know that people are praying for me and for Casey and for the elders. So thank you for that, Lord. For those who are struggling with unemployment, whose, again, whose livelihoods have vanished in this, pray that you would provide. That Pray that you would provide not merely for their material needs, for their physical needs or uh, spiritual needs. Lord, it's, um, it can really rock your identity and rock your soul to be out of work, to be out of your routine, to no longer feel like a productive member of your community, to no longer be able to provide for your family. So we pray for these people. We pray that you would keep them from all the dark places that they might turn in such a season. We pray that you would keep them from despair. And Lord, we do pray that you would provide. And when they come to the end of themselves, when they find themselves at the end of their rope, pray that they would call out to you. 
and they would seek you while you may be found. As Doug reminds us, we pray for those who are protesting the stay-at-home orders. Um, there are all kinds of people in those crowds, Lord, who are suffering with all kinds of things. Some are just bitter and angry. They think their rights are more important than the safety of their neighbors. And pray for those people, Lord, that you'd soften them. You'd help them to see that there is more to life than me and mine. Or there are others who are scared. Either they're ignorant of the data or they're not convinced. Or perhaps they live in a place where things aren't as bad as they are in Chicago or New York. And they don't understand the wisdom of staying at home. I pray you'd help them. I pray you'd convince them. And again, Lord, for those who are genuinely struggling, who aren't suffering from the disease, but are very much suffering from their lack of employment, their lack of income, their inability to feed their families, all these very real needs that would drive someone to take to the streets and to beg and protest, to ask that the that the, their livelihood, their community would be reopened, our hearts go out to them, Lord. Help us not to assume the worst of them. Help us to encourage and provide for them. Help your church to have eyes to see the needs around us and to draw near to these people and to serve them. And as Ellen reminds us, let us walk as children of the light. What a fitting place for us to end, Lord. You have called us out of darkness, and you have called us into your kingdom of marvelous light. You've made us citizens in the light, and you've called us to walk as children of the light. May we do that, Lord. In all that we do now, may we be beacons of light in a darkened world. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you all for joining me this morning. I want to remind you that tonight at, I believe it's 6 p.m., we're going to have our midday worship. You can find that video on our Facebook page, and you can click the little thing to get reminded that it's going to be on. God bless you all today. I'm praying for you. I'll see you next time.